Hey everyone, today we are in Revelation 10 and 11. In this passage, we learn that we are the people of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit to be witnesses to the revelation of Jesus Christ come hell or high water. And when we say that you are the church and that we are the church, just a reminder that this is a collective you. It is an us. It's not an individual calling to be the church, but it is one that we share together. So from the nursery to the 90s, from people who lived 2,000 years ago to us living in 2022, we are God's people. What that means is that you are recipients of God's grace, that you our sons and daughters. Look around your group this morning or this evening. The people in your circle are recipients of the goodness and love and mercy of God. And that together we are called to walk through life giving witness by the power of the Holy Spirit to the goodness of who Jesus is. So just remember, you're not alone and that we are in this together. And in today's video, Nancy Guthrie is going to pick up in verse 4 describing more about what it means to be the people of God and what it means to endure persecution and what it means to be faithful witnesses to Christ no matter the cost. These are, and he uses that same number again, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. Oh, we've heard that before. We know what that is, right? Two olive trees, two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours out from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have the power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. So these two witnesses, two olive trees, two lampstands, they all refer to the same thing the church, the witnessing church, those who have experienced new life in Christ and faithfully testify to it. These witnesses are telling the truth that the world needs to hear. Now, in in those verses, when he describes fire from their mouths and rain not falling, John is likely alluding, once again, to the Old Testament in 2 Kings chapter 1, verses 10 through 4, when the prophet Elijah called down fire from heaven to consume the soldiers who had been sent to arrest him. So here is heaven's perspective on the gospel and the power of the gospel that we proclaim. It might seem weak and foolish to the world, but in reality, the word of God proclaimed by his witnesses has incredible power. Look at verse 7. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some of the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents like Christmas Day, because these two prophets had been a torment to all who dwell on the earth. But after three and a half days... A breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and a great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. So the world finds the witness of the church a torment. They don't want to hear it. So much so 
that they will do the same thing that was done to Jesus to those who testify of him. They will kill them. And then they'll celebrate that the witnesses are dead. But it won't be the end because resurrection day will come. A day will come where it says here, a breath of life from God will enter into all who have died in Christ for Christ. Can you see what John is doing here? Can you see what he is doing to make the story of these witnesses sound like the story of Jesus? They're going to suffer like Jesus, but he wants them to see that they'll be raised to heaven like Jesus. The intended message to those in the first century to whom this was written and the message to us is the same. We should expect to suffer like Jesus. But we can also expect to be raised like Jesus. At that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Isaiah, Amos, and the writer of 1 Kings all wrote about events in which a tenth or 7,000 people were spared when judgment wiped out the majority. John seems to have this in mind and yet flips it on his head, writing that only a tenth will suffer judgment while the rest are terrified and give glory to God. Now when he says there, the rest, terrified, that they gave glory to God and gave glory to the God of heaven, it may be that he is simply writing about the same thing that Paul wrote about when Paul wrote about a day coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul seems to be describing a day when every human being will bow before Jesus whether or not they have called upon him for salvation. In other words, it may be that this mention of these people, this the rest giving glory to God, to the God of heaven here in Revelation, it may be an acknowledgement of who God is and his worthiness of glory that actually comes too late. Nowhere else in Revelation do we find anything that appears to be the conversion of many immediately prior to Christ's coming. But throughout Revelation, giving God glory quite often refers to a right response to God, the right response of true worship. So it seems more likely that this reflects the effective outcome of the trampling and testimony of the witnessing church, that while many will refuse to repent as they experience the precursors of the final judgment in the first six trumpets, there will be some who listen. They listen to the message of the gospel declared by the witnessing church. The threat of judgment in the first tr trumpets, that won't be enough to cause rebellious people to repent as the judgment themselves do not convey God's gracious willingness to forgive those who repent. You see, fear of judgment must be met with the truth of the gospel. The Spirit uses this declared word to go to work on hard hearts, replacing hearts 
of stone with hearts of flesh that are responsive to the grace of God. Some people like to say that talk is cheap, meaning, yeah, it's easy to say that. It's easier to say than to actually do something. Clearly here in Revelation 10 and 11, talk is not cheap. This talk, this witness, it is costly. They pay for their words with their lives. But their witness is also profitable. There is a return on their investment of these costly words of their gospel witness in the form of repentance and faith by some who actually listen and respond to their message. Another little saying people like to say is they say, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. It's a quote falsely attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. The book of Revelation will have nothing of that. The gospel cannot be declared without words. The gospel is an announcement of what Jesus Christ has done in history to make it possible for the worst of sinners, the most dedicated of idolaters, to be given new spiritual life. So what is amazing is that while most of the world will not heed the warnings announced in the precursors to the final judgment represented in the first trumpets, some will listen. They'll listen to ordinary people who are willing to be trampled as they offer a clear testimony to Jesus Christ. In John's day, and in our day as well, the church often looks weak, backward, compromised, sometimes just like the world around it. But amazingly, the church is God's chosen instrument for calling a dying world to a place of safety. And while it might appear at times that the church has been silenced and defeated, those apparent defeats are only temporary because of God's resurrection power. That's what we get to see when the seventh trumpet is finally blown. 